Good morning. We would like to welcome you to the 2020 virtual Charlotte R. Schmidlap Middle School Science Symposium. Due to COVID-19, we had to shift from an in-person experience to a virtual forum. <clears throat> and so we're super excited today. We have three presentations. Um, we want you to please feel free to ask any questions that you have. You can use the chat box or you can also ask them, unmute yourselves and ask them when the speakers get to questions and answer, answers. Um, we'll be recording the presentations um, and they'll be accessible from the um, the Middle School Science Symposium website and until the end of the school year. So I would like to first start by introducing my friend and colleague, Andrea Meisman. She is a Senior Clinical Research Coordinator in the Division of Adolescent and Transition Medicine, and her presentation is going to be about clinical research professionals. Andrea? Good morning. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm so excited to share with you all about my career um, as a clinical research professional and specifically as the in the role of a clinical research coordinator. First today I'm going to go over with you what type what is clinical research and what type of research we do here at Cincinnati Children's. Then um, I'll tell you a little bit about a clinical research coordinator's role um, in the research world. And last, I'm going to share with you about some of the cool studies I've gotten to work on over the years. Thank you so much to the OAACD team for inviting me to present. So how do you all think doctors know? How do they make decisions about how they take care of their patients? How do, they, how do you think they know what the best type of therapy is? How do doctors know what medications work? and how do they understand disease? Feel free to respond by unmuting and giving your thoughts or respond in the chat. How do you think doctors know? Do we have any responses in the chat? Yes, we do. Research studies? Yes, that's correct. Yes, yeah, so a lot of what um, clinicians um, do in practice is what they found works as part of clinical research. Well, what really is research? What comes to mind to you when you think about research? You can respond in the chat or unmute your audio and share your thoughts if you'd like. If you don't mind just letting me know if there's anything in the chat, I can't see it from my view right now. Sure, asking questions is in the chat, finding better treatments, Yes, those are all great, great answers. Exactly. Does the scientific method sound familiar to anyone? Might be something that you learned in science class. In research, we ask a question, develop a hypothesis, and then test it. Um, we follow the scientific method when we think about research. We can think of research as a carefully planned and monitored test. Today, I'm going to talk with you specifically about clinical research which is research um, working with people to develop ways to treat health problems, increase our knowledge, and, um, and find out new medicines and new treatments that help patients. So what kind of research do we do here at Children's? I'm gonna show you all a quick video to share some work here. What kind of research studies do we do? Our health institutions do research studies for infants, children, teens, adults, and the elderly. And the studies can be for anyone, young or old, healthy, or who have a specific condition or disease. We do many types of studies, including observational, treatment, quality of life, screening, genetic, diagnostic, and prevention. While many research studies involve testing new medications or devices, many do not. For example, there are long-term studies involving psychological tests or brain scans, while other studies might involve interviewing family members about their medical needs and history. How long can studies take? Some will take just 20 minutes, that's all. As you can see, there's lots of different types of research studies that we do here at Children's. But why do we do this? Here's another clip 
about why we do the research that we do here. Why do we need research? Why do we do it? We need research to help us find cures, save lives, improve lives, and strive for deeper understanding of how our bodies work. For example, our research has led to breakthroughs like the Sabin oral polio vaccine and the first heart-lung machine. But we need to continue research so we can discover the next generation of breakthroughs and discoveries. And that's why we do it. To keep discovering medicines, vaccines, and treatments that patients throughout the world are waiting for. Those discoveries that children and adults need. As mentioned in um, this most recent video, Cincinnati Children's has a legacy of innovation. Dr. Sabin um, developed the polio vaccine. Um, which has conquered polio in the Western Hemisphere. That's a virus that could cause paralysis. The heart and lung machine has also been developed here by a team of doctors, and it was used to perform the first open heart surgery. Artificial surfactant, a type of protein in the body that helps improve lung function in premature babies was also developed here. A vaccine for the rotavirus was first developed in a lab here and then a clinical research study was conducted. All of these studies um, have made great strides at Cincinnati Children's and then great strides throughout the world and country. And clinical research coordinators were a part of these great um, discoveries too, working um, with alongside doctors. So what is a clinical research coordinator? A clinical research coordinator, um, for short, also known as a CRC, is a specialized clinical research professional working with a doctor who does research. The doctor who does the research may be a medical doctor or could be a psychologist or another person with a specialized doctorate level degree. A clinical research coordinator ensures the study is being conducted in accordance to how the doctor designed this, the study to test a certain hypothesis or question, or to gather specific information. As our title suggests, we help to coordinate. So what do CRCs do? Our task may include some or all of the following. In helping prepare for a new study, we help write grants, submit documents to the Institutional Review Board, which is the board that makes sure our research is safe for the participants um, in the study, we help to prepare documents to collect data, which is the information that we collect as part of the study, and we create databases to hold all of the data. Our day-to-day -day activities vary depending on the type of study that you do, but may include recruiting research participants in clinic or in the inpatient hospital floors or through phone or email to explain the study and see if um, they all would be willing to participate. We also um, go through informed consent documents with participants. This is a document that explains everything that will happen as part of the study. We conduct clinical study visits. So this may include um, walking someone to an MRI scan or asking them study related questions. We collect data, enter data into a database, and ensure all the data is stored, otherwise known as managed correctly. What else do we do? We also get to have a part often in sharing the results of the studies, such as um, including presentations at a conference. For example, I was able to go to Washington, D.C. and present at the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine conference. We get to participate in sharing results through helping write papers that are published in medical journals. Here are two papers that I've gotten to the author on. And we can also help um, in dissemination of results that will lead to policy change. This means that our results help guide policy change that can help um, make laws about medical care, insurance, and treatment. So how do you become a clinical research coordinator? Here are some general requirements to think about if you think that this may be a career that interests you. 
Um, it requires a four-year college degree for an entry-level position. Depending on your responsibilities, you may need an advanced degree like a master's degree. Clinical research coordinators can find jobs at hospitals uh, or at different specialized companies that conduct uh, clinical research. So now I want to share with you a little bit about my personal journey as a clinical research coordinator and how my experiences brought me to this career um, to focus in clinical research. I started here as an intern. I didn't even realize that a clinical research um, coordinator was a career option until I started here in 2010. And during my research class in college, um, a CRC from Children's came to speak to our class about the work that they were doing. They were looking for volunteers for their lab. I applied and was invited for an interview and offered a volunteer position. I volunteered in a lab in the Adherence Center for two years until I graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology. I knew I wanted to help people and I liked working in the healthcare fear field as well. I liked um, working with people and with data. After I graduated, I started graduate school right away to pursue a degree in clinical mental health counseling, a master's degree. I also started um, to work in an entry level CRC position in the psychology department. I could work full time while getting my degree using the skills I had developed as an intern. A couple years later, I finished my degree, um, my master's in clinical mental health counseling with a plan to transition to um, working as a full time counselor probably after one year or so. I continued to work full time while counseling um, at a private practice in the evenings. After I had been working um, like that for about a year, I thought to myself and talked with my family and mentors um, about how much I really loved research. And I felt like this was my passion. I needed to really focus on pursuing a career within the research field. Research is my passion. I, could do, I can utilize the skills I've learned in school, but work on um, a larger scale to implement change. About three years ago, I've transitioned to the Division of Adolescent and Transition Medicine. And I found my home here. It's the people I connect with most. They share my passion for health equity and the um, link between physical health and mental health and working with adolescents and teenagers, which I also really enjoy. Over the years, I've continued to increase my knowledge, not only in clinical research, but also in different um, health-related topics. Um, and I've been able to advance throughout the years, gaining more responsibilities. So I found my home here and I continue to pursue my career in clinical research. So what is it really like to be our CRC day to day? My day to day responsibilities are a nice combination of desk work and um, working with co colleagues across the hospital and institution. Beyond meeting with research participants, collecting data and building databases, I get to learn a lot along the way. I like to describe the learning I've done as one of an accidental tourist. So stick with me through this analogy. Over the past 10 years, I've gotten to learn so much on various health related topics that I never would have come across if it wasn't for this career. I've gotten to learn um, various topics from working with children that have chronic conditions like asthma and diabetes and specific challenges they have to medication adherence, to learning new technology to teach providers or doctors how to communicate best with patients and families on, about certain topics. I've been able to get an accidental tourist um, getting a glimpse of different specialties. Like if you're taking a road trip and you stop for gas and realize there's a cool tourist attraction off that same exit, uh, you get to check out something that you may have never even realized was there. Over the years, I have gotten to work on a project of observing how teenagers use social media over the span of five years, a study looking at the impact of yoga for patients with eating disorders, learned about bone health for patients with eating disorders, primary ovarian insufficiency, which is a rare condition that impacts um, adolescents assigned female at birth, learned about youth who are transgender, 
and their health um, related needs. Most recently, I've gotten to work on two studies about an educational intervention using virtual reality. So many of you may have seen this um, that for video games, but we're using this to help teach doctors how to communicate effectively to their patients and families. In the next phase of that study, I will get to educate doctors on the best practices to talk with parents about behavioral concerns in their toddlers. Also, I've gotten to work on a survey project to gather people's opinions related to COVID-19. I think that it's so cool that the information we learn can help doctors understand what people think about COVID-19 and their worries regarding it. Um, it's something that has impacted the whole globe and how we can learn this information to help providers communicate better with their patients. Researchers specialize often in just a couple of topics, which is great about a career in clinical research because I get a glimpse into these researchers' specialties, learning something new with each project that I work on. I also specifically really like working in the division of adolescent medicine because it is a combination of physical and mental health. Um, and a lot of research focuses on um, behavioral change as well, which is aligns with my education. We also focus on health equity. So I want to share with you this example of what the virtual reality clinic space looks like for the project that I'm going to be working on um, in which we help talk to parents about um, behavioral uh, challenges that they may be experiencing with their toddlers. Um, the toddler avatar even throws a tantrum during the education simulation. So how this works is that a clinician who is participating will verbally talk with the um, avatars and they will talk back um, to share their concerns. And our um, aim is to help educate them with um, techniques that have been shown and other research studies to work well when helping to guide parents on different um, behavioral health guidance. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope this gives a glimpse of what it's like to be a clinical research coordinator as well as the type of work that we do in clinical research here at Cincinnati Children's. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So I have a question, Andrea. Um, what is some advice that you would give to any young person viewing this presentation who maybe thinks that he or she would like to pursue a career as a clinical research professional or e even just in STEM in general? What type of advice would you give a seventh or eighth grader right now? I think that it is important as you start to enter high school that if you are interested in a career in STEM or in research to take as many science courses as your um, school will allow. This will expand opportunities of different topics in science to see what you might like, be it chemistry, biology, psychology, because all of these have um, opportunities for research in the future as you get into college. So if research is something that interests you, there's a lot of ways to do research. So taking courses in high school to see what you may be interested in can help narrow your focus for when you decide um, what kind of major you want to go into when you enter college. And a little bit farther down the line, um, take the opportunities to apply for internships whenever you can. There's great opportunities throughout the city to intern um, and specifically at Children's there are um, often opportunities for summer internships or internships throughout the year because that can also give you a chance to explore something that you may be interested in and so then you can practice it and see if it is something that you really like and want to pursue. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Andrea? All right, well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Andrea. It's always a pleasure. Thank you all. appreciate thank it. So what we're gonna do now is we'll take a short break until we get um, ready for our next presenters.
So we would like to um, introduce our second presentation of the day. Um, Drs. Ndidi Unaka and Emmanuel Chandler. Dr. Unaka is a, an associate professor here at Cincinnati Children's and attending physician in the Division of Hospital Medicine. And she's also the associate program director for the Pediatric Residency Training Program. Dr. Chandler is um, in our division, as, just like uh, Andrea. Um, he is the, um, an assistant professor and also the medical director in the Division of Adolescent and Transition Medicine. Um, their presentation today will be about becoming a physician. So Drs. Unaka and Chandler. All right, thanks Dr. Hackworth. So Dr. Unaka and I are very excited to be here, but we're really just gonna talk about what it means to become a physician. So I think the first thing we're gonna uh, ask is what is a physician or a doctor? So of course, I think most of you know that a physician or a doctor basically practices medicine or take care of individual's health. So we make sure that you all as you all as kids or teenagers and adults, people in general are healthy and um, taking good care of themselves. And there are many, many types of physicians, lots of different types of physicians. And Dr. Yunak and I are just one of those different types of physicians. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next. So um, we want to kind of think about how many different types of physicians you can name. I'm not sure if they're able to speak or not, but we'll first talk about a little bit about what type of physicians we are. So I'll let Dr. Yunaka talk about kind of what kind yeah. of physicians we are. So both Emmanuel and I are pediatricians, so we are doctors that take care of kids. So we take care of patients who are as young as babies, um, all, all the way up to um, people who are 18 and sometimes a little bit older than that. Um, so we are really interested in ensuring that kids stay healthy and that they're developing well, that they're growing well, um, that they are doing well um, in school, that they, um, you know, have all of the things that are necessary for them to be healthy, that they're getting their shots. Um, and then we spend a lot of time also talking with parents because, you know, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, all the people who take care of you and love you at home, um, you know, it's important for us to connect with them too, to make sure we're giving them advice about what you need to do um, and what things they can do to make sure that you are healthy. Um, but there are lots of other types of doctors. So there are doctors who just take care of adults. Um, there are doctors who take care of kids and adults. There are doctors like, um, um, obstetricians who help deliver babies. There are doctors who do surgeries um, and can do surgeries on different parts of the body. Um, so there are lots of different types of doctors out there and we are just one kind. And so, you know, I think one really important thing that one question that we often get asked is, you know, how long does it take to be a doctor? What do you have to do um, to eventually get to the point where you can take care of people and make sure that they stay healthy. So all of you right now are in middle school or in eighth grade. Um, after that, you go to high school um, and that's four years. And then after you graduate high school, you have to go to college. So um, typically um, people take about four, sometimes a little bit longer or, or more years to get through college where you get um, an initial degree. Um, and there are certain classes that you have to take in college in order um, to eventually go to med school. So we take a lot of classes related to science. So biology and chemistry, um, some math classes and some other types of classes too um, that are important for us before we go from college to med school. Um, med school is four more years 
um, after you graduate from college and there are med schools all around the country. Um, so here in Cincinnati, we have a med school, University of Cincinnati, um, and you know we have lots of students who want to be all different types of doctors who um, spend more time learning about the human body and they learn about you know all of the cells that make up the human body and then in the last two years of med school they start taking care of patients in the hospital and in clinics um, to get ready to prepare them for the next stage and then after med school is when you start to really focus on what type of doctor you want to be so someone might say you know i want to be a surgeon or i might want to be a pediatrician or i might want to be an internal medicine doctor that takes care of adults um, and in order to do that you have to do a residency program um, residency programs can be um, can take different amounts of time so to be a pediatrician um, is a three-year residency program. To be a surgeon um, typically takes five to seven years to be a surgeon. Um, to be um, an obstetrician gynecologist, someone who delivers babies, um, that takes four years of residency. So all of those different um, times really helps us prepare um, to be able to take care of patients and families um, who have all different types of health needs. And then I'm going to let um, Dr. Chandler first talk about, you know, what really made him want to become a doctor and then I can follow after him. All right, thanks, Ndidi. So why did we become doctors? So for me, it really started off, I was about uh, a little bit younger than you guys. I was about eight years old when I decided that I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and uh, I really just wanted, you know, maybe like many of you wanted to be able to help people. But I also, as I kind of grew up and be, to, began to have different experiences, I really in, I realized how much I enjoyed working with kids and teenagers. And I wanted to be able to help um, in my specialty. I'm what I call an adolescent medicine doctor. So I take care specifically of teenagers. So people who are your age, in the ages of 12 to 22. And I really wanted to be able to help you all and help patients at your age transition from being um, kids into adults and be able to have an impact in your lives. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, and not just only help you from a healthcare standpoint, but also just in general in life and going through that transition because being a teenager can be challenging sometimes. It also is very, very, very rewarding. So I wanted to be able to do that and be able to help individuals and support your parents um, and do that kind of stuff. And then, you know, it's funny, um, in terms of what made me want to be a doctor, I think it started pretty early. I um, have four younger siblings. Um, so as the oldest, you know, I always was taking care of my siblings. And I, you know, I really enjoyed that, you know, part of me just um, you know, wanted to make sure that they were always doing well. And then I also really liked science when, you know, I uh, was a kid in school. So I remember on the weekends, my mom would always take us to the public library and I would always go to the section that had all of the books about the different parts of the body, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and I just wanted to know how they worked um, and what happens when they didn't work well and what we could do to fix it. Um, and so that was always just something I was really curious about. Um, and, you know, I didn't have doctors in my family, um, but, you know, as I went through school, I started to learn about how I could you know, do something that was related to science and also allowed me to connect with people. And so um, I thought a lot about being a doctor. I also thought a lot about being a teacher because, um, you know, that was something that I really enjoyed doing too. Um, I went to college um, and, you know, still thought about being a doctor, but also was thinking about some other things too related to science. But it was really when I had the opportunity to go and shadow um, a doctor who 
was seeing patients in clinic and was seeing kids that I really started to get excited about what it meant to be a doctor and then started to really focus and figure out what things I needed to do in order to be able to go to med school. And so I did that and um, prepared for one of the tests that you have to do when you're trying to go to med school called the MCAT. Um, you know, took it twice because the first time, you know, I wanted to get a better score. And so one thing that, you know, I want to make sure you all know is that just because you don't do well the first time doesn't mean you can't keep trying. Um, and if you have good people around you who can encourage you, who you can ask questions, um, there are plenty of people who have had to try to do things more than once um, in order to get it right. Um, and then when I went to med school, you know, I still thought I wanted to do something related to kids. And one of the things that I really love about being a pediatrician um, is that, you know, kids are just so refreshing. They're always so, um, there's just a joy to be around. Um, and kids oftentimes, um, you know, get better. Um, and I loved being able to have some type of um, role in making sure that kids could be healthy and grow up to be healthy adults. Um, and, you know, I love the role that doctors play um, in building trust with kids and their families um, and being able to guide them through really hard stuff too. Um, and then, you know, I remember my first, uh, my first idea of what medicine was. I thought all it was was just about seeing patients, but I also realized that I get the opportunity to teach too. So in medicine, you can do lots of things. You can take care of patients, you can teach, you can do research. Um, and so there's just a lot of exciting there, exciting stuff there. Um, so this is actually a picture of um, my team. When I take care of patients, I actually see patients when they are sick and come to the hospital. Um, and, you know, I get to take care of them in the hospital, help them get better. Um, and get them home as soon as I can. And so this was a week on service um, where we were all trying to wear something pink um, and it's really fun. Um, also the best part about being a doctor is that you don't work by yourself, you work in a team. So there are students on my team, I have social workers on my team, I have a pharmacist who helps us with our medications. Um, there's a dietitian who makes sure that our patients when they're in the hospital are getting the right amount of calories and nutrition. We work really closely with our nurses. We can't do our jobs without them. So I love the idea of working in a team um, and it makes my job that much better on a daily basis. And just like Dr. Uh, Unaka talked about, I also, teach in my role as a doctor too and a pediatrician and also this is a picture of me uh, providing patient care so that's one of the things that i really enjoy doing is of course taking care of kids um, and adolescents and then but also being able to teach uh, medical students and residents who are doctors in training on how uh, to take care of kids also and like uh, ndd said too is i love working working in a team and, and people and learning from other people. So I think that's a, one of the great things about being a doctor is that you are always learning and always working in a team setting. So you're always surrounded by people who are passionate about what they're doing and taking care of uh, patients and teaching. Uh, so that's one reason um, I also enjoy being in medicine uh, and doing what we do. All right, that is it. So we would love to take questions. I don't know if there's an opportunity to do that, Dr. Yes. Hackworth. Okay. Yes. Great. If, does anyone have a question? If not, I do. So I'm going to give them the first shot. All right. So I have a couple questions. The first one is, Please tell us some advice 
that you would give to a young person? So a seventh or eighth grader, like right now, um, advice that you would give to that, that individual if um, he or she is thinking about pursuing a career in medicine or STEM in general? That's my first question. Um, sure, I can go ahead and go. Um, so one, uh, my advice to them would be to, of course, you know, I think we all know to make sure you're doing well in school and making good grades and immersing yourself in, in, the, in your education right now to learn as much as you possibly can. Um, but my other part of advice is always surrounding yourself or finding mentors or sponsors that who are doing what you want to do. So uh, I know myself in DD, we mentor a lot of different people who are and young people who are interested in becoming a doctor. So if you have the ability to find those mentors or people, doctors you can shadow or people who are interested in pure even like research or whatever you're interested in, science field, finding those people that you can ask those questions uh, because I think that information is invalu invaluable to people who are, um, are coming up behind us. So finding those individuals that you can talk to and gain mentorship and information from about what you want to go into. Uh, I think indeed you not, um, alluded to this earlier. The other thing I would tell uh, young people is to not give up, right? So you, you're gonna come, it's inevitable in life that we're gonna um, come against adversity and things that may try to stop us from becoming what we wanna become. Um, I wasn't a great, a great test taker either. So um, the MCAT was not easy for me, but that didn't make me stop. I didn't have any doctors in my family either, but that didn't stop me either. So I think no matter what, don't give up because uh, if this is something that you wanna do, stick with it. Like I said, find mentors, find people who can help you get to where you wanna be and ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions about what, about what you wanna do um, because uh, you can't, you're, you're not in this alone. You're not an island to yourself and, um, and you shouldn't be. So you should definitely use the resources that you have around you to kind of get you where you want, you want to go. Thank you. I Dr. Unaka, would you like to add? Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, I think what's really nice about um, programs like this is that you all can get the chance to see people who were just like you all those years ago um, and who, you know, may be doing exactly what you want to do. Um, and so I think mentorship is really important. And then finding people who can connect you with other types of programs related to science or technology or engineering or math. Um, medicine, opportunities for research. There are so many different things that you all can get um, hooked up with. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out who to go to, to figure out what programs are available to you. But knowing that you can connect with any of us and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction, um, I think is powerful because I think networking and connections with people um, really do go a long way. And then, you know, I think being a doctor is not something that's easy. Um, and, you know, they will, there will certainly be hard times, you know, that um, come about. And there will be times where you want to stop or um, times where you wonder if you are cut out to do it. Uh, but just don't let anybody tell you you can't do anything. Um, because you can um, and you will um, and you can do it with the right support um, and the right guidance. Um, so just just use this as your resource as much as you can. Thank you so much. Um, just to piggyback, both of you talked about mentors and role models and I was wondering if you could share, like do you remember who um, were your role models or mentors when you were in middle school and I mean, you can even talk about um, now, you know, or anywhere in that journey to from middle school to becoming uh, physicians or doctors. Um, who are your role models? Who were your role models or your mentors? Okay. So for, <laughs> for, for me, my um, in middle school, it was actually my pediatrician. So my pediatrician was um, a black male. So and 
I didn't I had never seen a black male physician at all. So he was the first the first person I ever knew. McGrenet, of course, he took care of me as a baby too. But I didn't see very many black physicians around. So he was one of my my role models, um, and still is. Uh, he still practices to this day. Um, so going through middle middle school, elementary school, when he heard that I wanted to be a doctor, uh, he made it his place every time I went to go see him once a year to ask me if that's still what I wanted to be. And I, I was able to ask him at least one or two questions about, he actually wanted me to ask him a question about being a doctor. So he was one of my role models in middle, middle school. Uh, and then, you know, really my, my parents also were my role models for me too. Um, you know, my parents uh, did not go to college or anything like that, but they understood the importance of education and really pushed me to do well in school, pushed me to, um, seek out or they helped me seek out programs like similar to this one um, so I could be involved and understand what it mean, meant to be a doctor. Um, so my parents for me were role models and then right now I still uh, continue to have many role models. I mean uh, some of the role models are on this on this call so my foster Jessica Khan, Jessica Khan excuse me is my role model. Uh, I admire her leadership abilities and Dee Dee is a peer role model for me. I, I admire her what she what she does with education, the med school, and what she does with her work here at the institution. Um, so um, I have I have many role models and I have other colleagues that I went through uh, med medical school with um, that are continue to be my role models, my peer mentors. Uh, so I really appreciate all they all they teach me. Yeah, I would say um, in middle school, um, you know, definitely my parents, um, you know, my parents did not come from much. They, um, you know, they both came to this country um, to look for a better life. And, you know, they came here to go to school and, you know, we didn't, we didn't have much, but, you know, they always uh, believe that you know, we, we, we could do anything that we put our minds to and, you know, they sacrificed a lot uh, to get my siblings and I to where we are. So definitely owe them a ton. Um, I would also say, you know, I played sports all my life, including through college. Um, and when I think about the role that sports and my coaches played in my life, it was huge. Um, you know, even when I went to college, you know, I was very upfront with, you know, colleges when they were recruiting me that I wanted to be a doctor. And there were some that said it wouldn't be conducive or it wouldn't really work with, you know, the practice schedule and where I ended up going there. They were like, oh yeah, you can do that. And on my, on my visit, they took me to the anatomy lab that had you know, human cadaver, like they knew exactly what I wanted. And um, they said, we can make it work. We'll, we'll, it's okay if you have to miss practice to go to your science labs, or it's, it's, it's fine, we will make this work. Um, so I think um, having that type of support where I was able to um, achieve a dream of playing, you know, basketball in college and ultimately achieve a dream of being a doctor um, was really amazing. And then I would say one uh, role model um, and mentor um, that really um, inspired me to come to Cincinnati to do my residency was Dr. Mia Mallory. So she um, is a pediatrician as well and um, was one of the people in charge of the residency program when I interviewed here. Um, and you know she's a black woman and she looked just like me and I just didn't know that that was something that was possible in a role like this and so you know I think being able to see people that look like you um, that you can relate to um, really uh, was important to me um, and I definitely owe her a lot so well thank you so much for those amazing answers and that wonderful presentation. Does anyone else on the uh, meeting have questions? I could ask a question. Okay. Um, what is one of the coolest experiences that you have had as part of being a physician? Okay. 
Indeed, I'll let you go first. Ooh, this is hard because there's some there's some very cool um, and also very unique experiences that, um, as a physician, um, sometimes we take for granted. I think what we what our patients and families allow us to do um, is is not um, is not something that everyone gets to experience. Um, so, in part of my Part of my job um, when I take care of patients who are in the hospital means that I take care of some kids who are um, really sick. Um, and sometimes those kids don't do very well. And so I would say, while this isn't like a cool part of my job, but it's certainly one that I um, just never want to take for granted is being able to support families through some really, really, really difficult decisions. Um, being able to make sure that I am able to honor their wishes and seek out what's most important to them um, and build really strong relationships with them. Um, uh, I think it's something that like when when those times happen, I can sit back and reflect and say, wow, this is not this is this is this is this is really hard, but it's something that I wouldn't trade for anything. Yes, I, I agree with Indeed. I think one of the coolest part parts of my job is the relationships I form with my patients. Um, I think I'm in this unique place where I'm seeing uh, my patients kind of transition from being kids to adults. So I often see them leave Cincinnati Children's and go to the, into the adult world. I think one of the best thing is I had a patient that um, went off to the military actually, and he called the clinic to thank me just for taking care of him and providing care for him. Um, so that was that was special to me. To, um, because I only had been his doctor maybe for like a couple of years, but he, for him to call back and to just to say thank you um, was, was rewarding for me to know that we had made this connection and uh, that he appreciated the care that I provided for him. And I, I don't take it for granted because like, you, like patients allow us into their lives, um, into their private lives to take care of them. So uh, I really appreciated that. And then I also had this unique opportunity to provide care here at the Juvenile Detention Center, and that's a very unique setting. So to be able to provide care to those kids, and I've had seen kids in the community who have come up to me um, to thank me or just to let me know how they're doing. So uh, that's that's special for me. That's amazing. Thank you so much. You guys are really making a huge difference in the lives of so many people. So we thank you so much, and with that, we'll. Um, get ready to transition to our 1230 presentation on um, careers in psychology and mental health. So we'll take a short break. So you can take a bio break or, um, you know, turn your screen off or, you know, your camera. Um, Dr. Chandler and Unaka, thank you so much. Um, I know you probably need to go take care of patients. So it's okay to drop off the call now if you need to. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, we just want to welcome everybody back to our 1230 session here, and I have the honor of introducing our, our next presenters, Dr. Rebecca Ridg Ridgway, Dr. Teresa Smith, and Dr. Ann Calamaris. Dr. Ridgway is a staff psychologist in the Kelly O'Leary Center for Autism Spectrum Disorders. Dr. Smith and Dr. Calamaris are fellows in the Division of Behavioral Medicine and Clinical Psychology. Dr. Ridgway, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Calamaris' presentation will be on mental health and psychology. Thank you so much for being with us today. All right, thank you so much for having us. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. We're very excited to um, see the interest in psychology and um, to give you a little bit more information about the various roles and responsibilities that we have as psychologists. So. Um, as was mentioned in the introductions, I'm Dr. Rebecca Ridgway. I'm one of the attending psychologists um, within the Division of D Behavior Medicine and Clinical Psychology. My clinical work is done within the Division of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. 
So by training, I'm a child clinical psychologist and I've been practicing as a licensed psychologist for 10 years. Um, so next I will introduce um, Dr. Annie Calamiris, who is a psychology postdoctoral fellow. Um, so a postdoctoral fellow means that she's in her last years of specialized training prior to becoming licensed as a psychologist. And um, she has a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. And then last but certainly not least, Dr. Teresa Smith is another postdoctoral fellow um, and also has her doctorate degree in clinical psychology. Um, so both Dr. Calamiris and Dr. Smith are in their last year of training and that this time next year um, will be licensed clinical psychologists. Um, so as you'll hear from us today, there are numerous opportunities within the field of psychology um, and even among those that are trained specifically as psychologists. So we'll touch briefly upon some of those areas and then provide examples of a day in the life of what we do as child clinical psychologists within an academic medical center. So while the three of us work with children and adolescents between the ages of about one to 18, and in some cases, even young adults, there are other psychologists that only work with adults and some that work with kids and adults. Um, in addition, there's different opportunities um, to work in a variety of different settings as well. So while we work within a children's hospital, there's psychologists that work in schools, community mental health centers, um, doctor's offices, prisons, and even for sports teams like the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, and then even within the hospital, psychologists are working with different populations of kids. So the roles that psychologists have within each of those settings may also vary greatly. So for example, many psychologists conduct research um, and that research can vary, but often involves developing hypotheses that answer specific questions in order to apply those, in order to apply those results of the research study to kind of real life and what we do day to day. So research is how we learn, for example, what type of treatment is the most effective for certain diagnoses. Another role that psychologists can have is more administrative, such as overseeing clinical programming. Um, so for me specifically, a large part of my role is administrative as I direct our training programs, which both Dr. Calamiris and Dr. Smith are in, in order to train future psychologists and then another administrative role that I have is as our associate clinical director, which means that I'm responsible for ensuring our clinics run smoothly um, by performing a variety of different tasks. And then another role for psychologists and the one we'll primarily focus on today is the clinical role, which means that psychologists work directly with individuals who may be presenting with a variety of concerns, including depression, anxiety, behavior, delayed development, um, feeding or toileting difficulties, social difficulties, um, a variety of different things. Um, so how we interact with these individuals can be further broken down into doing testing, which helps us identify a specific diagnosis um, or treatment, which focuses on um, working towards improving behaviors, decreasing negative emotions, or even developing certain skills. And then these types of treatment possibilities also vary greatly even with children. Um, so you may be wondering how um, the three of us got to the point of where we are at today. Um, in order to become a psychologist, there's different levels of training that someone needs to complete. So first would be completing a bachelor's degree during undergraduate, which is usually four years of college, primarily doing classes. Um, there might be some opportunities to gain research experience during that time as well. That's followed by graduate school in psychology, which is generally four to five years of a combination of classwork and training opportunities in working within practice settings. And that graduate school, there's a variety of different options for graduate school. There's school psychology, clinical psychology, and then clinical psychology, which again is what the three of us are specifically trained in. And then after the four to five years, one year of a clinical internship is required in which you just receive more in-depth training. And then in order to get licensed in most states following an internship, one to two years of the postdoctoral fellowship is also required, which is usually where you would receive more specialized training in your specific area of interest. So for doctors Calamaris and Smith, their specialized training is within the field of developmental disabilities.
I'm going to take over now. Um, I'm Dr. Cal Maris. I'm really excited to be here today. And um, we just thought it would be interesting to gather from everyone just some general information about what psychology is and trying to determine if there are any myths that we can debunk about psychology. So it looks like some people are already answering this true or false question, which the first one is that psychologists can only work with individuals who can talk about their feelings. And yes, Everybody has accurately said that is false. So although talk therapy was originally designed to help people process those thoughts and their subconscious, some research is suggesting that that may not be helpful for everybody. And there are several other methods that we can use to change thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And in my work um, here at Cincinnati Children's with um, Dr. Smith and Dr. Ridgeway, we actually serve young individuals and a lot of individuals with developmental disabilities who may not have the capacity or ability to talk and use their words to communicate. So what we do is we work with their families and their, um, and their providers to really structure their environment so that they learn how to regulate their emotions and behaviors. Also some psychologists that we're going to talk about in just a bit that make people aware of how their body reacts to certain triggers or certain stressors um, to increase awareness and promote regulation in those situations as well. So the next question that is true or false is that psychologists can change the way the brain works without medication. So everyone just take a moment and say, is that true or is that false? Awesome. Yeah, you guys are already experts at this. That's right. That is true. So the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist is that psychologists go to school, go to graduate school to change um, to change like emotions and behaviors and thoughts through behavioral intervention, whereas psychiatrists actually go to medical school and they're the ones that prescribe um, psychological medications that may help people to regulate their emotions and behavior. And actually, with advancing technology that can really read the activation of the brain and the structure of the brain, we're finding through research that there, um, some of the behavioral interventions that we use really change the way that the brain is not only structured, so how much of different parts of the brain are growing, but also how it activates. So behavioral intervention can really change the way that the brain is working as well. All right, final true-false question. Being a psychologist is mostly just about common sense. That's right, that is false. So like what Dr. Ridgway was saying, we use a lot of research to guide how we approach interventions. While that is said, a lot of the research that we're doing is really informed by some of those common sense things. Understanding that it's helpful to talk to somebody when you are feeling upset and maybe it's helpful to process our feelings. So, while um, your psychological mindedness, so how well you kind of think like a psychologist can really help you um, in this profession, we try to use research to guide our approach to not only how we diagnose individuals, but how we then um, help to change their emotions, thoughts, and behaviors as well. All right, well, I am gonna switch gears and talk about a day in the life of a psychologist. Um, and as Dr. Ridgway mentioned earlier, this can be very different based on the population that you work with, whether that's children or adults um, or another population or the setting that you're in. So I'm gonna focus on the work that we do with children with developmental disabilities and their families here at the hospital. And what we do on a daily basis in terms of our clinic, which you can see an example of the space here on the right, a picture of one of our clinic rooms, as well as the clinic hallway here on the left, um, is provide treatment and assessments to families. Um, and our assessments look at the thinking skills of children, um, as well as their behaviors and their emotions, and maybe looking for areas of strength for them, as well as areas of challenge that we can help them with. Um, and so you can see here in the middle is a picture of one of our assessment rooms. So our assessments use all kinds of fun activities. It's not like a typical test that you take in school. Oftentimes you're doing puzzles or playing with toys and it's very interactive. Um, so not like a typical assessment or evaluation that you might think of. 
Also, we spend a lot of our time documenting what we do with children and their families. And this is important for a couple different reasons. First, in a treatment setting. So if they're doing treatment to improve their emotions or behavior in some way, we wanna make sure that they're making progress. So how they came the first day, we wanna make sure that they've improved since then. Also, um, we document in terms of assessments and evaluations that we do to make sure that we're accurately capturing the kid that we're seeing as far as their thinking skills, their emotions, their behaviors, and then providing appropriate recommendations and diagnoses to help their parents deal with um, difficulties that they may be having at home and their teachers and educational teams to help them with difficulties they may be having at school. And I think a really important part of our documentation is we like to highlight strengths as well. So a lot of kids come to us with um, concerns, but they also have a lot of strengths and we feel like that's important to document in addition. Psychologists also meet a lot. Not only do we meet with our fellow psychologists, but we also meet with our medical colleagues, with our social work colleagues, a bunch of different disciplines to make sure that we're providing the best care to children and their families. And really the rationale for most of our meetings is to do just that, to learn about new ways to provide care, to learn about best practices, and how we can always be improving what we're doing to better help children and their families. As a psychologist, I, as a psychologist, excuse me, I have to say that um, we are often a lifelong learner. So that means, like I said before, that we're constantly improving what, how we do things, the care that we're providing to children and their families, as well as thinking about how we can apply new information that we learn, whether that's research um, from science or evidence-based practices that are coming out. And so if you're a really curious person or enjoy learning, this is a, a really great field for you. So we're going to show you some videos of um, the things that we do. And the first video that I'm going to show you is an assessment with a three-year-old child. Um, and I think what you'll see is that we have a lot of fun and it's super interactive. So not typical in what you would think of as um, an assessment. All right. Okay. I'm going to do my blocks like that. You do your blocks just like that. Like what? Like this one. Nice work, Nora. Okay, can you make a really tall tower? How tall can you make that tower? I don't know, but I made for now. Oh no, let's see. Oh my goodness, wait, can you add these to a tower? Nice work, Oh, should we make a crash? Okay, so for this one, Nora, what you're going to do is you are going to match the card to the picture that it goes with, okay? So you're going to decide which one this one goes. Does it go here, 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 or here? Put on. Yeah. Nice working. Yeah, it goes there, right? Because they're both the same blue shapes. Mm -hmm. Nice working. Let's do some more. What about that one? Nice work, Kim. They both go there because they're both small yellow circles. What about that one? Yeah, nice work, Kim. Except they're different colors. Yeah, except for they're a different color. That's such a good point. But they're both cuddly bears. I'm going to tell you some things to do. So you got your listening ears on? Yeah. Let me see them. Where are your listening ears? Oh, there they are. All right. Nice job. Okay. Give me the car. Give me the horse. Thank you. Give me the watch. All right. Put the horse in the box. Nice work in. Give me the one that you draw with. Thank you. Give me all the animals. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, nice work, Nora. What's this? A pink grass. Oh, you know all these. I pink. What is this? A high cotton. Nice work, Ed. What's this? Can you say that? 
other moths. What did you say? Tiny to that other moths. Uh huh. What's that? Bedroom. Yeah, nice work, Nora. A cell. Oh, you already know what to do. All right, so that was an example of an assessment that we might do with a three-year-old child here in our clinic. And I'm gonna let Dr. Calamara share an example of a treatment video um, that we also might do as a psychologist. I will share that, hold on one Thank second. You. So psychologists are using something called biofeedback, which I alluded to briefly earlier, but really what that means is we're using the way our bodies respond to different stressors to guide when we know it's time to engage in some relaxation strategies. So we're basically trying to calm down how reactive our body is to these stressors. So I don't do any biofeedback, but I went and met with a psychologist here at Cincinnati Children's who has some expertise in that. And um, she explains it beautifully in this video. So what we're going to do today is do some relaxation training with biofeedback. And so what we're going to do is hook you up to the temperature um, leader reader. And so basically it's going to send a message to um, my computer about how warm your finger is. So the idea is that when you're learning a relaxation exercise, that if you're able to kind of let your muscles go and get relaxed, the impact would be that it would make your your fingers warm up because it's increased blood flow versus if you're tense and tight because you're either stressed out and lots of pain, you hold your body kind of tightly and then it would mean your fingertips are a little bit cooler, okay? So what we're gonna do first is I will put this on your finger and then I'll show you, we'll do a baseline reading, practice some relaxation and see how much we're able to get your temperature to change. Awesome. All right. So. Yep, thank you very much. What I will do is go ahead and take this on your index finger. All right. So now what I'll do is go to the computer and show you the reading. Okay. All right. As you can see, she taped a little temperature reader to my finger and um, Dr. Smith is now going to pull up the output from that. And this day was actually really stressful for me um, because I had gotten into a car accident that morning. And so it's a really nice illustration. So as you can see, kind of like what um, the psychologist was saying in the video is that low, this red line, if you're lower, that means you're more stressed because there's less blood flow. And if you're higher, that means you're less stressed and there's more blood flow to your fingers. So you can see that this peak right over here um, is where um, the psychologist had said, hey, tell me about what happened with your car this morning. And then you can see that the blood started rushing from my fingers um, and went down that big slope. And then we started practicing some relaxation strategies through deep breathing to calm down. And you can see that blood returned to my fingers. Um, so this is just a nice way that psychologists can use the body to really inform how um, they're providing intervention. Yeah, and you, there we go, awesome. So we wanted to open up the floor now for any questions that individuals might have about what psychology is how to become a psychologist. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So when you say um, you have a clinical internship, so does that have to be after you take an undergrad or you have a grad degree? But there are also internships that like when you're like, let's say when you're in high school that like you can shadow a, like a therapist. Is that sorry, or a psychologist? Is that also like, do you, do you need like a degree to do that or is it just, no? That's a, that's a wonderful question. So, um, so there's different ways that we think of internships. So the internships that I was talking about is more formal. That would occur after the 40, the four to five years of um, graduate coursework. Um, there are different opportunities at different levels as well. So. For example, I believe here at Children's, um, I think you have to be, I think, 16 in order to um, shadow um, some providers within the hospital. We 
we also have an undergraduate training program as well. So we have um, undergraduate students, usually juniors or seniors, um, that are interested in careers in psychology, um, doing observations in our clinic as well. So they apply to do um, either a semester long or a year long internship. Um, so that way they can learn more specifically what it's like to be a psychologist. Yes, there are opportunities prior to the formal internship after graduate school to do some shadowing and it's a great opportunity to truly learn if, if that's the skill that you might be interested in. So question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, I have one. Go for it. Okay. Um, please tell us what brought your interest into this field. Did you always want to be a psychologist or was there some, is this something you grew uh, into loving? That's a great question. I'll take that one. And then I think uh, Dr. Smith and Calamiris can also um, chime in. So um, I think I fell into psychology after I took a psychology class in high school. I just loved learning about um, human development, behaviors, and certain diagnoses, um, and um, kind of just seeing how what was available within that field. I think more specifically in the area that I am in right now in terms of developmental disabilities, that came through um, doing some additional trainings while I was during in my undergraduate years um, that made me truly um, want to specialize in this area. So I think a lot of people have a lot of different routes, so I'll be curious to hear what others um, have to say as well. Yeah, so I think for me, I've just always loved working with people, and so I've always been attracted to um, opportunities, whether that's jobs or classes in college that um, talked about human behavior and interacting with people. And so I think it was something that kind of felt natural to me. Um, but then as Dr. Calamaris was talking about, along the way, I realized that there's a lot that you have to learn with psychology um, in order to be a good psychologist. Um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, are not common sense and um, are really interesting and backed by science. And so I really like that science part as well. And I'll echo what doctors Ridgway and Smith were discussing as well. Um, I think that I had an innate curiosity in um, trying to understand human behavior and I had a pretty strong background and interest in child development. And so um, I did a lot of babysitting and working in daycares in um, middle school and high school and really getting to work directly with children. And it made me very passionate about doing that in more of a service role. Um, and so I thought it was really unique that psychologists could work in a hospital setting and really provide that treatment and intervention um, without having to provide any medication. And so it just felt like it was a good fit for me. And I think that it was continued to be developed throughout my um, undergraduate career when I was participating in research and learning through coursework um, more about the intricacies and of psychology broadly. That was a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions? If not, I'll ask one last one and then <laughs> um, let's see. What is um, what is a challenge that you faced on your journey to becoming um, what you are today? And how did you overcome that challenge? Uh, that is a great and a very tough question. Um, uh, goodness, I would say, I think the biggest challenge for me was um, probably midway through graduate school, just thinking like, gosh, I've been in school for, for so long. Um, but I think the thing that got me through it is ultimately I knew where I wanted to be in the end and, um, you know, having the opportunity not to just do the, the coursework, but actually being able to do the clinical practice, even when you're still in school, helped me realize the connection between what I was learning in school and being able to apply that, um, you know, in my, 
in my uh, training session. So I think that's what ultimately helped me get through it is being able to apply and then ultimately seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I completely agree with what Dr. Ridgway said. I think the time investment in becoming a psychologist can feel really daunting and overwhelming. Um, and I think particularly in graduate school, they're training you to do a lot of different things. So even if you, regardless of the type of program that you go into, you're going to have a research component, you're going to be taking coursework, and you're going to have those applied experiences. And so I think for me, it was hard to balance all of those things because I was so interested in so many of them. Um, but I think once you are able to really find what you're passionate about, and for me, that was the clinical work. Um, it became a lot more fulfilling um, day to day. Yeah, I think I would definitely echo what's already been said um, and also add that, you know, there are a lot of really neat things that you can do when you're in graduate school, um, but unfortunately you only have so much time to do them all. And so I think something that was hard for me was picking which opportunities I really liked and figuring out where my interests really lied and just focusing on that because that's the great thing about psychology is there's so many opportunities and it's such a broad field. Um, but you can't do everything and you can't be the expert in everything. So you have to really figure out what your passion is and where you wanna focus your attention. Okay, well, I just wanna thank you again for joining us today and uh, providing this presentation. I, uh, I learned a lot. So I know that um, you know, the, the students that are gonna be viewing this and, and who are on the call with us are definitely got a benefit. So thank you again so much for taking the time and providing your expertise. <laughs> Welcome. We're happy to be here and, and, and share that expertise. So thank you. Thank you.